Thank you. Great. Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? I'm just curious. Oh, you won't be able to see me? Okay. I will jump back on the stage. So I'm curious, how many teachers do we have in the audience? Excellent. Well, I will try to be, um, I, I will try to hopefully make this relevant for you all. So I'm Jason Young, and I am co-founder and CEO of Mind Blown Labs. And this is me during my senior year at Harvard. And as you can see, I was quite happy. And it wasn't just because of the little red cup in my hand. <laughs> in just a few days, I would actually be graduating, and I would become the first in my family to graduate. And more importantly, I would be graduating without debt, thanks to great financial aid and three part-time jobs. And so I was very excited about that latter part because a few years earlier, I figured out that I was deathly allergic to cats and also <laughs> non-productive debt. In, but in all seriousness, when I was a sophomore, I experienced Grinchmas. I'd gone home for Christmas, as usual, and the holidays were always my favorite time of year. If you can imagine it, my entire family, aunts, uncles, cousins, relatives, would descend on my grandparents' house, and they would all squeeze into their small two-bedroom home in Compton, California. We'd exchange presents, we'd tell stories, and best of all, this was the only time of year that my granny made gumbo. And my granny's from Mississippi, so this was really, really good gumbo. So this Christmas started off like all the others, but it ended very, very differently. The day after Christmas, my family was evicted. My mom had taken out a variable rate mortgage, interest rates, she didn't really understand it, and when interest rates increased, she could no longer afford to make the payments. And so she eventually lost the home, but in trying to keep it, she also accumulated tens of thousands of dollars in credit card debt and eventually had to file for bankruptcy. So this experience, more than any other, taught me the importance of making wise financial decisions, but also instilled in me a very strong desire to help other people do the same. So let's fast forward. I went back to school. I declared economics as my major. I graduated, and then I went to work for Merrill Lynch on the private wealth side. And I did that for a few years, but I really wanted to get back to doing work that was both more entrepreneurial in nature and that would also allow me to have a broader impact. And so I left Merrill and I joined an early stage technology startup called Wickinvest. And Wickinvest's mission was to help young adults who were not financially savvy to make much better investment decisions. And in the process of working at Wickinvest, I was also volunteering on the side, helping young adults with their personal finances at a very basic level. Think budgeting, think credit scores, debt pay down, et cetera. And in doing that work, it just became readily apparent to me that the problem of financial illiteracy, the inability to manage one's personal finances and to make wise financial decisions that will impact one's life outcomes was far greater than I had ever anticipated. And I started doing research. I found out that 95% of high school students graduate financially illiterate, and this problem doesn't really go away over time. And so I was compelled to do something to try to solve this problem at scale. So I called my best friend, Ty Moore, in case, you don't, in case you're wondering, he's the one with the hair. And he, right after school, had gone back home, started a nonprofit, working with inner city youth, um, helping them to get into college, teaching them 21st century skills. And I told him about my idea to solve this problem. He got really excited, and eventually he transitioned out of his nonprofit. And together, we decided to do something about this. But we knew that we couldn't do it alone. So we assembled a multidisciplinary, diverse team of innovators, hailing from all over the country. And <clears throat> Jim has experience in tech entrepreneurship, game development, education, financial services. And 
Collectively, we've worked with thousands of young people directly. We spent about 200,000 hours working in a professional capacity to engage millennials in particular, and we have built products individually that have reached millions of folks. And we set a very ambitious goal, which is to imp substantively impact the lives of 20 million young people by 2020. And to do that, we founded Mind Blown Labs. And Mind Blown Labs is an education, technology, social enterprise that creates highly engaging experiential learning tools that empower young people to make excellent financial decisions. And our goal is really simple. Starting in high school to empower young people to make decisions that will lead to letter, better life outcomes. So our first solution is a mobile game called Thrive and Shine. And Thrive and Shine is a financial capability game where students create an avatar, they guide it through life, and they make thousands of financial decisions similar to those that they'd have to make in real life. And here is just a very short preview of what that looks like. Thrive and Shine is a hybrid learning experience, which combines a mobile... I'm just gonna cut that a little bit short. And, because I really wanna to get to, you know, the heart of what I'd like to share with you today. Um, so the good news is, one of the things we found out is that Thrive and Shine actually works. So students, you know, are one, positively addicted to it. And two, more importantly, even though we're in the early stages of collecting data, we found that 70% of the high school students who are surveyed actually are saying that they are changing their behaviors, their financial behaviors in real life. So that's the good news. Um, but with that said, the journey hasn't been all peaches and cream. We've made a ton of mistakes along the way. And I'd like to just share some of the insights that we've picked up as we've gone through this process of innovating. This is by no means comprehensive, but I hope that some of these insights might be helpful to you. So the first insight may sound very basic. Know your audience. Most people would say, hey, you should know your audience. How can you build a solution for someone if you don't understand what their needs actually are? Pretty simple premise. We went into this process um, with this premise. But one of the things that we learned is that knowing your audience is very different from really knowing your audience. And so to do the latter, it's really, under, it's really important that you understand not only your audience's wants and needs and who they are, but you also understand how do you reach your audience, the very specific environment that your audience is, your audience is operating in, and also not only your audience's expectations, but the expectations of anyone else who might influence your audience's ability to access the solution that you're creating. So let's start with the first, distribution. Distribution you know, doesn't seem very sexy, but it's actually critically important. And so when we started off, we were really focused on high school students. And our goal was really simple, create the best financial capability game possible and make it so engaging that they were willing to play it in their free time. So within a week of starting development, we were putting it in students' hands, we were getting feedback, we were learning what worked, what didn't work, and we did this religiously throughout the process. And so the good news is we succeeded in making a game that students would play in their free time. The bad news is that even in succeeding, we failed because we really hadn't figured out how we were going to get the game into the hands of many, many, many students. And you know, it was available for download in the App Store, but so are a million other apps. And you know, frankly, we didn't have the budget to compete with those apps. So, Eventually, we decided that we wanted to distribute our game to students through schools, and particularly, we wanted to engage teachers like you all in the audience. And keep in mind, I'm coming from a tech background, so this was actually a pretty Herculean task. And here's what I mean by that. So one of the things we found out was that teachers and students are drastically different. 
and the things that are important to teachers sometimes vary quite markedly from those that are important to students. So for instance, one of the things we found out was that ease of use for many teachers, and I'm not gonna say for all of you, but for many teachers actually trumps engagement. And so that was a huge lesson for us. And so while we had this game, we said, hey, it's engaging and students appear to be learning from it, that actually wasn't enough. Uh, what we found was that a lot of teachers wanted curriculum. Um, it was very important for them to be able to monitor the students' pro progress, so they needed a dashboard. Um, and there were a lot of other things that needed to be in place for teachers that students didn't necessarily care about, but that were critical you know, to gaining adoption. Second thing is, Environmental, environment changes constraints. Very quick example, a lot of apps, many games, are over 100 megs in size. And people from you know, most socioeconomic backgrounds, even those from the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder, are able to download those games, no problem, because generally they can find a Wi-Fi connection somewhere, even if they don't have it in their home. But if you're doing this in the classroom, this can be very problematic because over 100 megs, depending on your plan and your carrier, you need a Wi-Fi connection to download. Students may not be on Wi-Fi and or, even if they are, having 30 students download 100 megs at once in a classroom setting can be extremely problematic. It can cost, say, 20 or 30 minutes, which is a deal killer. It may mean that the, you know, our game, in particular, never gets used. Finally, one of the hard lessons for us was that if you're doing an early stage innovation at an early stage technology startup, you actually sometimes, in our space, financial literacy in particular, get held to a higher standard than pre-existing organizations, whether they be for-profit or non-profit, and whether they be tech-based or more traditional brick and mortar. So for instance, in our space, virtually no one has proof of efficacy. So no one really knows if their stuff actually works. For the record, I think we absolutely need to provide our young people with solutions that have been proven. With that said, if you're creating an innovation, typically you innovate, you create the solution, you test the solution, and then once you've reached a certain scale, you then get efficacy information. What we found actually was that there was an expectation up front that we had the efficacy information, even though many of the larger, much more established organizations that have been around for decades actually did not have any of this information. So that was a lesson for us. And so now I'd just like to talk very briefly about how we solved, you know, how we went about addressing these issues. So first, we took a step back, we re-examined our approach. One of the first things we did is we hired an actual adult to join the team. Um, so <laughs> Maggie is actually a classroom teacher. She has been in the classroom for over 20 years, and she helped us to one, develop a very experiential curriculum to run pilots in 10 different states, in, in, in classrooms throughout 10 different states, and um, to really put more structure around our entire process. And we learned a ton, and I can say one, teachers have started to adopt it, and then on the efficacy side, the other thing that we did, we were very privileged to win a research contract from the US Treasury Department to conduct a randomized control trial on the efficacy of our entire solution. So we've actually gone from being reactionary to in very soon having one of the most rigorous efficacy studies in the entire space and helping to set a higher standard. And so I just leave you with these few words. Um, I found that innovating is really, really hard if you actually want to make an impact and not just build something that looks cool. And it's extraordinarily important to understand your audience. It sounds very simple, but it's something that you really have to put energy into over and over and over again. Thank you.